So this past summer, I watched this TED Talk called The Shared Experience of Absurdity. And it's about uh, Charlie Todd. He's the founder of an improvisational group in New York and the projects that they um, put on. And one of them really stuck out to me. Um, and it's the one they're most well known for, but it's, they had footage in this TED talk of this lady sitting on the Metro and a man with no pants gets on and she looks incredibly uncomfortable. Um, and she doesn't make eye contact and she keeps looking down. Um, but as more people get on the train, she starts to kind of look up and look at them and they start to make eye contact and share smiles and make faces and um, really develop a bond in a relationship um, over what's happening, like the absurdity going on around them. So this started to kind of turn me on to this idea of the shared experience, that term. So I researched it after I saw this video and I came across upon this article um, that essentially states that humans value experiences over things, which is such a cool idea, especially now when we're being critiqued for being so consumer driven. Um, but essentially the article talks about this anthropologist um, named Victor Turner, who in 1969 researched this um, ritual theory and it the theory states that when you go through a ritual and this can be something extraordinary like a wedding or something ordinary like eating lunch um, you with the people around you transition into another realm of being and then you take what you learned in that situation and apply it into everyday life and so What's special about that is that the people that go through this transition together develop a bond and it can be people from all different backgrounds, um, all different like ethnicities, all different social economic statuses, anything. Um, and it really binds you together because if you're experiencing the same thing at the same time in the same place, you're an equal in a sense. And so this is this binding factor is called communitas. Um, and an example of how this works now is the perpetuation of the the movie theater because we have, there are so many ways for us to watch movies on our own for cheaper Netflix DVDs but the movie theater has persisted through this because people inherently want to share these moments together um, even with a bunch of strangers so they want to laugh and they want to groan when something someone does something dumb in a movie they want to do all of this together so I started thinking we value community so much here at William & Mary that this idea of communitas and of the shared experience has to take form here somehow um, so I asked through an online form for individuals to anonymously nominate student groups, clubs, organizations, other individuals who sort of use this idea of communitas to either further their own goals or that their mission was to simply foster a shared experience at William & Mary. And I received over 30 submissions. Um, and so I narrowed them down and then enlisted the help of a friend um, to help document this idea. So together with Chris Cordova, um, this, this is what we have. Okay, um, <laughs> uh, my name is Katherine Ambrose. Um, I'm a sophomore at William & Mary. 
and I'm the creator of the One Tribe, One Family video campaign. Um, I was inspired to create this video at the beginning of my sophomore year. There was a lot going on on campus. Um, I felt like there were a lot of different groups um, that were separated uh, in the community and it didn't feel like an all-inclusive kind of school that I wanted to be at. And so I created this video to try and bring everyone together um, under a common theme. And that common theme was bystander intervention and respect in the community. Um, I didn't really know what I was doing. <laughs> I um, just had an idea for, for a video that could be passed around to lots of different outlets and lots of different groups. Um, and I tried to make it happen. So um, how I started was that I uh, sat down at my computer and I think I took about an hour um, and wrote the entire script um, because I knew exactly what I wanted to say and I wanted to talk about the different problems here on campus um, and get a message out to the entire community. Um, I tried to pick people who would deliver the lines who um, were representative of all these different groups on campus. So um, we had someone in the frame uh, for the video where anyone could be watching the clip and resonate with that kind of person or, or identify with that kind of person um, and think, you know, I've seen them around campus. They're a good role model. Um, this is, this is an important message. So we started filming and I had um, no prior video experience. I didn't really know what I was doing. I didn't know where the on button was on the camera to start with, um, but I watched a lot of YouTube tutorials uh, and figured it out eventually. Um, and I put it all together. I filmed it in about three days for everyone. Um, and put it together with uh, one of my friends, Rory Park, on um, a Sunday, and then it was released on a Monday morning. William & Mary prides itself on being the first. The first school chartered in the United States. The first college to become a university. The first to create a student honor code. We set an example for all centers of academia. But we face the same problems as all other universities. So right here and right now, it's time for a conversation. Where we all talk. Freely. Honestly. About what we face day in and day out. Suicide. Sexual assault. Alcohol and drug abuse. Racism. They still exist. They're here. On our campus. And it's time for us to do something about it. We are not special in dealing with these issues. But we can be exceptional in our response. When you chose William and Mary. When you chose the green and gold. When you chose to take the honor pledge. You chose to be part of a family. And as part of our family, we take care of each other. We don't stop with refusing to lie, cheat, or steal. Because the real problems happen outside of the classroom. And off the field. We need to take responsibility for our campus. As members of our tribe, we get in the way before it happens. We ask if he's OK. We get our friends and everyone else home safe. We tell her that's not funny. We stand with survivors. We watch out for each other. We don't look the other way. We stand up step up, take responsibility. When we see something that isn't right, we interrupt. We hold each other accountable. We make each other better. We say something, we do something. To be a part of the tribe is to be responsible for your friends, your classmates, your family, when they need you the most. To be part of the tribe is to respect women. To respect diversity in all forms. To respect yourself. To respect all members of our family. It's on us to create a culture of respect. Don't look back and wish you'd done something. Be strong, be bold, be brave. It's on us. We are. We, we are. are. We are. One, one tribe. tribe. One family. I chose video to start with because I know um, how shareable it is and how it can be applied to a lot of different organizations. So um, it's easy for freshmen to view coming into William & Mary. It's easy for people to share on Facebook or on Twitter um, or on Instagram or, or over email. Um, and I think everybody knows how to use YouTube. So um, it was definitely something that could reach the masses in a big way. Um, I really like how how visual it was and how you could look into the camera um, for the people that were acting and and create a connection with the audience um, and I so I tried to make sure that that was coming across in the video
the the response for the video was a hundred times more than I could have possibly imagined. Um, it took off in the morning, and they actually had I had sent it to um, the president of the student body um, on Sunday night to make sure it would be sent out in the student newsletter on Sunday morning. Um, and people were already sharing it by the end of Sunday night because he had shared it with the whole student assembly. So that was crazy to see. Um, and then in the morning, I woke up and I had checked Facebook and there were already people sharing it, already people tagging me in posts and saying, you know, thank you for creating this, which was awesome. Um, and by the end of the day, I had people coming up to me and saying, oh, I'm, oh my gosh, I saw your video, um, which was pretty surreal because I didn't think that it would take off so quickly. Um, it was shared with uh, the school in different um, alumni newsletters and parent newsletters, um, sent over different listservs uh, for different groups on campus. Um, I had talked to uh, some people in the athletics office and they're trying to figure out how to use it for um, basketball games or football games at halftime or that kind of thing, which would be fantastic. Um, and right now it has uh, over 6,000 views on YouTube, so pretty cool. <laughs> I always knew that I wanted to do something that could be shared over, over social media, not just you know posters around the college community or anything, um, but something that would be able to be shared amongst so many people and within such an easy format like the internet. It just made sense. Um, I got fantastic responses on on the internet and people messaging me and telling me um, what a great job I did or that kind of thing. But what was really great was to see people come up to me in person and say, um, I saw your video. It really resonated with me. Um, I feel so inspired by it, which was great. Or it would be complete strangers coming up to me and saying, oh, are you, did you make this video? And I'd say yes. And they'd say, wow, it was great. Um, thank you so much. And that was cool because it wasn't just shared in my own friend group. It was shared around um, for different classes, for different sports teams, that kind of thing. So it definitely reached more people than I ever could have asked for. Um, I, I think that that was my goal was to reach so many people, especially the ones that I didn't know and get that message out across to. It was never meant to be um, a video that would be we would be shown all the time and then you would watch it and, and that was it and then the message stopped. It was something that was going to um, stick in your mind and resonate with you. So maybe in those those times when you're trying to make a tough decision about, um, you know, my friend needs some help tonight or and she's not she's not all the way there or um, my friend needs some extra attention right now or this girl in my class looks really upset. Uh, I should probably go check in with her that kind of thing that my video and my message would just kind of be in the back of your head to try and get you to create that respectful community and, and always um, have a little bit of a conscience in the back of your mind. So when I came to William Mary, um, I did not know a single person here um, and I was terrified. I was so scared that I was in over my head and I was never going to um, have this good college experience because I, I didn't know anyone. Um, and I was, I was scared to put myself out there. And when I came to William & Mary, I realized that that was not a, a rational fear to have because everyone here was so welcoming and so supportive and wanted to get to know me um, before I even knew what their name was. Uh, and so I have never been in a community like this before um, who, who just, w just looks out for each other and um, constantly wants to make each other better. And so um, with everything going on at the beginning of this year, I felt like everyone needed a little bit of rem a reminder about that. Um, and I wanted to, you know, for these freshmen coming in, I wanted to make sure that they knew that they were supported and that they were part of a new family. Um, and so my video was kind of an, an attempt at that and creating the same community that I feel so lucky to already be a part of. So, yeah, that was it. <laughs> Okay, cool. So my name is Liz Jacob. I'm a sophomore and I'm the founder and president of Schoolhouse Block.
So for me, Schoolhouse Block was kind of an opportunity to take what I lo- I've learned in class and what I've seen on campus and find a way to funnel that into action, find a way to get people excited about something because it's more than fundraising. It's more than just sitting around and planning events. It's the opportunity to really think about international development and about the impact we have with education to really take that a step further. So for me, I wanted to have the opportunity to consider international issues, but in the scope of something that I can understand, which for me, I've spent my whole life in school, so why not education? Why not something that I can really be a part of and really take forward? Looking at before the project, which is what we're kind of in right now, it's like within the fundraising stage, we've worked a lot to connect every fundraising event that we have, everything that we're doing with an awareness component. So there's like a why behind what we're doing. Like, yes, we're raising money, but what does that money go towards? I think that's important. It's letting the William and Mary community know that like every dollar they put towards this is not just a dollar going to help a community and help this like broad idea of the third world and taking the third world somewhere else. It's helping an individual become the best version of themselves they can be through education. And so that's really what we're pushing. And so I think in this early process right now, the proposals really help to ground us and it helps us to study Nepal and to understand the Nepalese environment as far as you know, the physical environment, obviously looking at sustainability, but also looking at the political, the economic, and the social and cultural spheres that make up a country, that make up a community. And thinking critically about that before we go is, I think, so important, especially because we're going to get to go as a, as a group ourselves. We'll be able to send 15 students to Nepal. And so those students will get to spend 11 days actually physically constructing the foundation of the school and working to establish community ties. And in addition, going through a cultural immersion program, we're going to do homestays. We're going to get the opportunity to really live and eat as rural Nepalese do. I think that's a very unique opportunity because a couple other organizations do similar trek ideas of being able to go and see the inception of the building, but not a lot of groups actually let you do the hard work and actually understand that the community helps build the building itself. And it's engagement the whole time. It's us, it's build on, and it's that Nepalese community from the beginning. When we're now writing the proposals, when we're constructing the school, to when we leave Nepal, we're going to have the opportunity to stay engaged with that school as long as we can. I think that's a very unique opportunity. We can establish as much of a connection as we want and build on really leaves that up to the chapter. But we have the opportunity to establish a tie with a school that could create community between Nepal and William and Mary for as long as our student body can sustain it. And that's something very unique just because it'll be a primary school, but we can have, because they're going to put computers and stuff like that, we can have pen pal programs, we can have connections, we can have continuing education. And they have adult programs as well. So that's an opportunity for us to really further microfinance ideas. Like we have a great business school here. How can we take those ideas and empower someone else and let them run with their own ideas by using these other resources? So I do think it's a very unique way to really come in at the beginning to think about what we want when we're going to that physical construction, to physically construct, and then to take a step back, come back to William Mary, and then think, how do we want to help this move forward? How do we want to make sure that we hold ourselves and the school to the same levels of standards that we started off with? And how do we stay true to these ideals? And we don't let this fall by the wayside just because it's two years later and we're back where we were before. I blame it on my ADD, baby. This is how an angel dies. I blame it on my own supply. So my name is Lorraine Pettit. I'm a sophomore at the college, um, and I'm currently the chief financial officer of Schoolhouse Block. So. I felt like Schoolhouse Block was a really great um, opportunity to kind of tackle certain issues that women do face, like not um, like inequality within education. Um, and so I feel like that's a great medium to, um, you know, just to like, give women the opportunity to be educated, um, just to learn like very like basic things that we really take for granted, I think, um, to really kind of better their own lives and um, give them a more uh, stable stance in society. Um, and that's kind of more like the idea that I like really wanted to join Schoolhouse Block and like kind of the direction that I wanted to take um, my own like, you know, where I like wanted to prioritize and spend my time as a student. So I just transferred last semester um, and I, and it was like, the, I went to like the first like info session um, and honestly like I didn't even think that like a lot of people were going to show up, you know, like we're going to build a school in Nepal, you know, we made a couple flyers for like an info thing about it. Um, and I, I mean, I had known about it from ladies like prior to that, but I mean, I just, I didn't really think that a lot of people were going to show up to it or that we were going to get quite the response that we did. And I think 
especially like seeing how the exec team has like developed and how people have been like coming back to meetings and being so eager to like engage like hey like let me help you design this flyer like let me help you set up this thing at like lodge one for this awareness event um i think just like seeing that like speaks so much to like actually how remarkable this community is because i mean i can i can definitely say that like from the institution that i did transfer from like I would have, I would have never expected that. Like, I mean, maybe it would have happened, but like, I mean, I just can't really think of a time where it was just like, wow, like, look at this response from people. I mean, we, and we're also like starting out with like nothing. Like we have, you know, $150 is like raised currently. Um, and so we still have a lot more, a lot further to go, but people are still so enthusiastic about this. And I think the energy and passion that you get from this group just speaks to the larger um, dynamic at William & Mary, uh, which really is why, Blame very special, you know, there's really nothing like it out there. Uh, I'm Jeremy Relosa. I'm a junior at William & Mary. Um, I am the education block leader of Schoolhouse Block. Uh, so I'm in charge of working with um, the School of Ed and uh, other grad students at the School of Ed uh, to help develop proposals and lesson plans for our, our school that we're trying to build in the fall. A lot of what my job is is just kind of like answering the question of why are you guys trying to go to school in Nepal? Obviously people know that it's great. Um, who doesn't want that to be part of their part of their town? Like a school is very something something very vital. But um, people ask like why Nepal or why not another lesser developed country? And um, I guess awareness is, is my job is to, to kind of educate them on uh, the circumstances that uh, the region is going through. Um, why education is really important to Nepal, and a lot of the why questions I'm asked, I'm, I'm answering in my position, um, because uh, it's easy to kind of get lost in this kind of oh yeah it's good like humanitarian work, but it's really get down to the to nit, the nitty gritty so to speak of, of of why we're doing it is is really my job. So yeah, we know that we're going to a lesser developed country. Um, third world isn't always a good term to throw around because it can it's just it's just it's just a muddy term. So it is a lesser developed country and, um, you know, the culture shock, so to speak, won't hopefully won't be, uh, won't hinder our, our, uh, our goals or our thoughts of accomplishing our goals in the community, um, which is like a rural part of Nepal. So um, I guess what to expect is that um, in terms of building it, uh, we'll be helping out for the week that we're there. Although it's only a week, we will be doing, um, you know, uh, our part. Uh, I guess uh, raising the monetary goal is our big, is our big, um, I guess, like, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, it's kind of, I don't want to say goal because what our goal is really is awareness, but um, once we achieve that, that uh, $30,000 mark, um, what's it called, uh, build on will kind of help us uh, in terms of actually building it because a week there can't really fully build a school. So our experience there in a week will, will, really be a learning experience. Um, we'll get to connect with people from our, from our uh, higher up organization, build on. And um, yeah, it really should be just a learning experience and getting to see what it's really like there. Because uh, you can only do so much just by researching online and Wikipediaing your trip, um, but getting there and actually helping out with the people is, is definitely the meat of what we're doing. Uh, I'm Michael Christensen. I'm a junior at William & Mary, and I am chair of fundraising events for School Off Block. So what we're really trying to do, we have a profit share actually with Peter Chang, which is a local business. Um, and we're going to try to really engage in the community, the Williamsburg community, even past William & Mary, um, and get people to come and support our group um, from Williamsburg at large. Um, we're passing out um, our flyers, trying to get um, people from you know, local areas to come and eat at Peter Chang's and we get 10% of the profits when they eat and use our code. Um, and we just feel like it's a really great way to include members of the Williamsburg community past William & Mary um, and kind of get them to know about Nepal and, and illiteracy and things like that. So it's interesting because when we started last semester, I was like one of the five people who were in the club. It was just like the current exec board, maybe one or two other people. And then beginning of this semester, we really reached out and we got a huge response. Our first meeting of the semester, we had like 40 or 50 people. We've maintained those numbers the entire time so far. 
and some people who are just really, really excited about it. Um, I've actually never like seen this level of excitement um, in other groups I've been in. Um, but like everyone has so many ideas they're putting out and so many things that they're like so many different facets of our club that they're interested in. Um, and it's, it's really cool to see people from William & Mary get so excited about something. Um, but we have people who are interested in nonprofit work, um, and we have people who are interested in education, people who are interested in sustainability and gender equality, just all across the board, everything that we're really focused on, there is someone who's interested in that specific aspect of our group, um, which is cool, because then they get the opportunity to really focus on what they're interested in and uh, kind of bring it to life, which is, which is pretty unique, I think. Um, my name is Thomas Fergus. I'm a junior at William & Mary, and I'm one of the co-founders and co-executive directors of Tribethon. And my name is Eileen Dolan, and I'm also one of the executive directors and co-founders of Tribethon, and I'm a junior. So, Dance Marathon is actually a national organization that partners with Children's Miracle Network hospitals across the country. As of now, over 300 universities have Dance Marathon partnerships, and 90% of Children's Miracle Network hospitals have Dance Marathon partnerships. In 2014 alone, these partnerships raised over $19 million, and so we wanted to be a part of that movement. And so um, all the point of Dance Marathons is that all the funds from your events stay local, so we partnered with the Children's Hospital of the King's Daughters in Norfolk, Virginia, um, and they serve the Williamsburg area and like lower eastern Virginia area. Um, they're Virginia's only freestanding full service pediatric clinic, pediatric hospital that serves kids from birth to age 21. So we wanted to partner with them to keep our funds local. So the goal was to really um, bring together all the different clubs of William Mary. So we didn't want specifically Greek life or specifically multicultural organizations. Um, we, want, we didn't want to target a specific group of women Mary, but we wanted to tar target the entire community. So we wanted to see representatives of Greek life club, we wanted to see representative, representatives of um, sports teams and multicultural groups, and also we really wanted to get the faculty and staff together for this. And um, with that, we also wanted to reach out to the greater Williamsburg community so that we could all come together for this. Um, so we weren't really sure how like receptive the William and Mary community would be. Um, everyone here is advocating for their own cause and their own uh, particular organization. But we, like looking back, we thought it went really well. We definitely hit on uh, all different aspects of campus, especially in terms of participants and fundraising. Um, we were incredibly impressed with our goal. We kind of set a lofty goal for ourselves of $10,000 and we overcame that and made it up to 13,000. So we were really impressed with that. Um, and we were very proud of the fact of how many different types of people participated in the event. Um, so as we were saying before, Tribethon has been in the works for about a year and a half now, and the legacy has grown exponentially. We've had so many people come up to, this, up to us this week being like, Dang, like you guys are advertising this so well. So we want to build on that legacy. Um, even though that this is our first year on campus, none of this would have been possible without you. So give yourselves another round of applause. Um, we want the name Tribe Thought to ring proud and true to everyone who steps foot on this campus. So moving forward, this has been a year long effort of Fundraising, canning, coloring, decorating, dancing. More dancing. Smanging. More smanging. Sitting on the terrace and tabling. We've done a lot. Um, so we just want to say if anything today has inspired any of you, please come talk to one of us after about how to get more involved in THON, whether or not you want to apply to be on the exec board or apply to be on a committee. We got all the answers and we want you guys to be as involved as possible. Because you guys are awesome today. So this legacy will hopefully be William Mary's newest and best tradition and we just want
want to keep on keeping on and kill keep on the game dancing next on. year. here and find your name please while I'm talking. Okay, so before the big reveal, we just want to take a minute to re revisit our original fundraising goals. So originally our fundraising goal was $10,000 and just a month ago we had a little over 2000 So yeah. That seems impossible. Yeah, that was not super up there yet. I think it was really surreal because Thomas and I have been planning this for so long and we weren't really sure how it was going to work with the Waymere community. So seeing people come out and having fun and maintaining a positive attitude and seeing them start to understand what Dance Marathon is all about, it just was so exciting. I think that, I don't know, we just had such positive reactions that Thomas and I were very happy to see that the Waymere community was receptive of this idea and that they wanted to see it grow too. So the Circle of Hope is definitely one of the most notable, notable moments of the day. Um, the Circle of Hope, it's a time for everyone to kind of reflect back on the day and how the progress that they've made just throughout the day um, and also think about all the progress that the children have made through the hospital. We had patients come throughout the day and speak. Um, there was a four-year-old girl named Audrey who came and spoke and there was also a 21-year-old uh, man named Drew who came to spoke. So it was really cool to see the range of people and the Circle of Hope was just a time where everyone who had been there for so long kind of came together and um, we played a song and we told them to listen to the lyrics and like the song was called Dream Big and so it was Dream Big for how you can make the biggest impact you can on these kids and on uh, the hospital and on our community and it was a time where everyone who had been there came together in unity and Eileen and I then went around and cut off the patient ID bracelets and gave them a glow bracelet in, in the celebration that they've come these eight hours like let's make it these two more. Dance Marathon is really unique um, in that it's really symbolic. We're asking for people to stand on their feet for 10 hours in recognition for those who can't. And when people face a challenge together, like standing on their feet for 10 hours, it really unites them because they're sharing that common cause. And um, so it's just really awesome to see everyone come together in this fight against pediatric illness. And we understand that 10 hours is a long time for people to commit to, especially on a Saturday. Um, William Mary students might have other things that they would rather be doing, but we were um, incredibly pleased with the amount of people who came and decided that they did want to be a part of the cause because it really like it becomes a movement once you're all together. It's like we are fighting for this cause together, and um, it, it was just incredible to see it. like the majority of people who were there were committed to staying for the whole ten hours because they believed in the cause.
Hey, I'm Hannah Luker, and I'm a sophomore. I'm Aaron, and I'm also a sophomore. I'm Kevin, I'm a senior, and I'm the team leader of Team Lafayette. I'm Madeline Hendricks, and I'm a senior. I'm Ben Weaver, and I'm also a senior. Um, so weekly, um, each of us spends time with uh, kids who, who are in high school, um, and those are uh, Christian kids and non-Christian kids, um, and that can be like hanging out one-on-one, -on -one, um, or that can be going and watching sports games, like Hannah and I just made plans to go see the musical in like two weeks. Um, we've been, gone to see one acts, um, I think people have done far more like widespread than that. Um, and then also we have two like planned events each week. Um, and one of those is club, which is like it's games and singing and fun, um, and it's like pretty silly. And then one is um, campaigners, and that is um, kind of like a Bible study um, for kids in high school. And um, we actually just came from that, um, and that's when we gonna get together and. Um, talk about what it means um, to follow Christ and what that looks like um, in high school because I think that's something that's kind of tricky to figure out in high school um, and church can be a tricky place to like can be hard for high schoolers to understand. Um, so that is I think a pretty good synopsis of what we do on a weekly basis but I think someone else can hop in if you would. Yeah I mean other than the, the two main events um, Club Campaigners is just like going where kids are um, no matter where high school kids are, whether it's practices, games, hanging out at IHOP at Free Pancake Day, like whatever like it takes to like be where the kids are, um, build relationships with them, um, like that's that's where we go. So going to the school like after school several times a week to see people and just trying to make plans to hang out um, outside of school just to be wherever they are and build those relationships. Yeah, um, like our goal is for all the kids we meet to be able to hear the gospel. Um, and get to like think about that and get to understand what that is, but it's not something we expect. Like, at, you know, when we go into things, we our expectation is not that they have to hear that. We just want to hang out with them, um, invest in their lives, um, and if that's all they get out of it, that's good enough for us. We also get the opportunity to uh, take the kids to um, a one-week summer camp, and um, it's a really fun experience. I went a few times. Um, in high school and also middle school and um, basically that's when we really get to just like enjoy uh, time with the kids like running around doing silly activities um, and it's there's like a giant club event where we like they have funny games funny skits and um, and then they also have a talk at the end of each club um, that the kids really get to hear the gospel kind of full out throughout the week and um, really understand um, who Jesus is and why he is relevant in our lives um, and so it's just a really fun experience uh, at camp. Um, so uh, at club events we always uh, make sure to have some fun games that everyone can participate in. We call them mixers because it gets people kind of going and um, we've actually as a team recently decided that we wanted um, to have two mi mixers at our club instead of just normally people just young life leaders do one mixer um, because we've seen that is the most enjoyable thing and it gets everyone involved uh, there's this one game that we played twice recently and it's called birdie on a perch and uh, we tell the kids to partner up and get in two circles where one of the partners is in one of the circles and they're going opposite directions we have music going like as if they're playing musical chairs and then we stop the music yell birdie on a perch and they have to run in the craziness and find their partner and somebody, one of them like jumps on each other's back and um, it just, it's such a simple thing but there's just like a lot of laughter sometimes somebody will like fall to the ground and it's just really fun uh, and we've seen a lot of, sorry I probably went out of the camera <laughs> um, but yeah, I move a lot. But yeah, that's a really good example of just a fun game that get, everyone's involved and it's meaningful to everyone and everyone has a shared memory. From it. Yeah. I think one of the things I love about club, um, I mean, I think birdie on a perch is like really fun for high schoolers. I think club in general, um, like singing um, is a lot of like 
it's like jumping up and down and kids like running around. Um, I actually running around is, is a euphemism that's not really running around. <laughs> it's like, um, but kids like singing really loudly, like singing at the top of their voices, um, and then like putting their arms around each other, but getting to be out of their comfort zone and also to be um, with each other. Like those are things that you just you don't really do in everyday life. Um, I think that's one of the things that's really special about club is like you get to be in a group um, and so like there's kind of that anonymity of singing in a group but also like being together um, and like getting to do something that you never get to do. Um, and along with um, Birdie on Perch, something that, that also made me think of um, is at camp we there's one night where you do um, western night and you dress like you don't dress up but there's you're walking from somewhere and all of a sudden there's like a big like country fair set up and you play games and you run around and like you're with your whole cabin and it's really fun um, and then you also as an area um, or like as a specific school will do um, line dancing which is actually <laughs> like I remember like the first time that someone was like yeah and the next thing we're gonna do is line dancing <laughs> No, no, like, I, I'm going to be sick, I have to go. Um, and then actually, when you, like, watch, it is legitimately one of my favorite things in the world to watch kids do this, um, because you see kids at first be really nervous about, like, like dancing, with, either with, even with someone they know, like, doing the Virginia Reel um, is very funny, and then, but also, getting to see legitimate, like, the only word that I can use is joy, like, faces, like, so lit up, um, and kids, like, laughing, like, there, the pictures from, um, this summer when we were at camp watching kids, just being able to, like, um, have, like, very innocent fun together, um, I think is a shared experience that people just don't have, like, especially in high school, um, in college or whenever um, is something that like really just doesn't exist that much um, and so I think that's been something that's been really cool like both in club um, and in camp and um, all that's going on let's talk about campaign and <laughs> um, for, before you do that I just want to interject um, like think about like what high schoolers like what day to day life is like for high schoolers trying to like be accepted and like find meaning in like their day to day and it's like trying to go to high school, be cool, like get the most likes on Instagram and Twitter. Like there's no it's it's so like surface level and it just feeds insecurities for these kids and just a, like there's no there's no like real relationship. It's all I mean there there's some, but like it's a lot of like surface level, like I need to be cool so that I'm accepted, so that like I feel okay like getting up and going to school in the morning but to see kids like doing line dancing or we did a game where it was like kind of like finger jousting but he was slapping the other person with a banana peel like we did that last semester and I had a kid come up in the hallway like this past week and be like that was so fun like I want to do that again but like a group of kids like no matter what clique or like what like portion of the school they come from to be in a room with like dozens of other kids and just like having fun together as a group with no like pretense, no, like, oh, this kid isn't a cool kid, why am I doing this with him? Like, they're all there, like, in a community together, sharing experience, like, being accepted, um, no matter who they are, like, genuinely having fun and being cared for, and that's, like, really, really cool to see, um, and it just doesn't happen anywhere else, frankly, for a high schooler, um, so it's cool to be a part of, for sure. And I would say, like, I mean, club, like, the point of club is to be a non-threatening place to talk about Jesus. Um, but if you ask anyone who's ever done in life, like, they will tell you that a successful club, like, is a place where a kid is going to come to somewhere where they're accepted and, like, feel loved and, like, they're going to have fun with their friends. Um, and so, like, it's, it's cool to look back, like, on our successes and failures because, like, like, when we boil it down, like, relationships are the difference. Um, and, like, when we, like address something that, like, hey, that really sucked. Um, we can look back and be like, well, this is why, like, no one knew the song we were singing, or, like, no one wanted to be, like, singled out and, like, eat corn on the cob off of a moving power drill in front of everyone. Um, and so, like, it's funny to see, like, the way that, like, when we do things, like, big games that include everyone, or, like, songs that everyone knows, and, like, everyone is a part of the same thing, like, 
those have been like the things that we have like seen the greatest success in and like it's awesome to be able to like plan for something and like now that we know like okay like we know that people love doing this like we know like this is a shared experience that everyone enjoys like we get to use that um, and like create that environment of like acceptance and like feeling loved um, which like Ben said is like not necessarily a place that these kids are used to being and like certainly is not a way to describe high school so like it's cool like that like you we can tangibly see like relationships are the difference Um, my name is Sam Pressler. I am a senior government major, recently dropped down to a finance minor from a major. Um, and I am the, I will say, founder and president or executive director, depending on the day, of the William Mary Center for Veterans Engagement. Throughout my life, um, <clears throat> throughout my life, the military and veteran-related causes were a um, pretty huge element. Uh, my, both my parents were born on Air Force bases, and um, though I don't think they would say they grew up in a traditional military family, um, it was an important element of their upbringing, and that kind of carried through to my upbringing. Um, so it's something that was at the top of mind. Then, uh, when I was a junior in high school, um, I lost my uncle to suicide, and, and so I became much more aware of the mental health challenges, not just veterans were facing, my uncle was not a veteran, but people in general and families face. So, you know, with that as a background, around the, uh, I guess it was the winter of my sophomore year, um, so I can't do the math, but 2012-2013, I think, uh, I was reading up a lot uh, in the newspaper uh, and in the news about and the challenge that veterans were facing. And a report came out that uh, from the VA that 22 vets um, were killing themselves every single day. And uh, moreover, uh, there were some more reports of the challenges the VA was having with the veterans backlog, a backlog that numbered over a million. So with that in mind, I started figuring out what initiatives can we do um, at William & Mary to serve the veterans community. It, it was just trying to understand how we can best give back given our institutional resources here and the fact that we, um, as I think other people have alluded to, are in an area with over 300,000 vets. Hampton Roads has 300,000 vets. And so uh, quickly I, I kind of came to the idea of comedy for veterans um, because I knew in my, my past when I was feeling down, um, comedy really helped to pick me up. Um, so I started pushing pretty hard and figuring out uh, if we could bring a comedy program for vets to William & Mary. Unfortunately, there was no comedy program for vets out there, and so I didn't really want to start from scratch. I wanted to have a partner organization, so I continued research and stumbled upon a group called the Veterans Writing Project, um, which, as it sounds, it's a writing program for veterans, uh, really focusing on telling uh, your unique military experience. And so it's a two-day seminar. It's taught by a guy named Ron Caps, who's a U.S. Army veteran, served in Iraq, Afghanistan, and then worked for the State Department as Deputy Chief of Mission in Darfur, Rwanda, and Kosovo. So um, he himself had uh, been through a lot of challenges, almost took his own life, um, and used writing uh, to help deal with his own PTSD. And he then decided to get back and, and start this program. So the Veterans Writing Project, um, we invited them to campus, uh, I'd say, you know, in the spring after I had that. Um, epiphany over the winter break, uh, and he eventually held his first seminar at William Mary in December of 2013. Um, we've then ha had two more seminars at William Mary, one in February of 2014, and then another this fall in November of 2014. And so I think, you know, when we look at it, the Veterans Writing Project was the catalyst, the first program we offered, but then we realized 
fairly quickly that there were more was more interest in the community than just writing. There was other interest in the expressive arts. And that's how we ended up expanding into the Center for Veterans Engagement, which now also includes a comedy component as well as a uh, music component. All right, um, so my name is Yusuf Alamin. I'm a junior here at the college. Um, I'm one of the co-directors of the writing initiative of our Center for Veterans Engagement. And what we've been involved in this semester is um, the writing group. So it's a monthly veterans writing group that we've been, um, it's involving William Mary veterans as well as um, people from the Hampton Roads area. So all across, um, and we actually spread that to the ODU campus. So we now have um, two separate writing groups that kind of go um, they follow the same kind of parallel path um, and cover the same topics, but they're for two different areas, so much more accessible for vets. I think, yeah, I, th I think it's funny the dynamics that they form. They're always, they kind of naturally and organically happen. And I think from the get-go to like me, Sam, and Alyssa, we said to ourselves, like this writing group, we don't really know what to expect going into it. Like we're going to try and be prepared for anything that they throw at us. But honestly, like we went, we went in there the very first day with, um, a couple of prompts, we got some food prepared for them and we just thought, you know, this is something that we're going to have to work from our mistakes from the first time and really perfect. And I think from the very get-go, um, and I, I, it was really immediate, um, the satisfaction of what we've been involved in, just because you could tell um, the veterans felt just very comfortable um, around in a room full of people who have had similar experiences with them or can sympathize with that. Um, and I think, you know, it's obviously other veterans are able to do that because they um, have served in the military and they have their own military experience and then they have college students like me Sam and Alyssa taking time off of our Saturday afternoons to spend time with them so I think they really um, appreciated and felt appreciated by us which is really the, the important part um, and just from from the very beginning I mean like I said it was very natural there were dynamics between all the veterans um, and some of them were less um, more reluctant to share and some of them loved sharing their works and so it really it worked out um, from the very beginning and it was kind of cool to see it develop and grow from um, a group of four people who didn't really know each other and now we have over 10 people that are involved with the writing group and I think we're excited to see see it grow in the future too. I can relate to how you felt about joining the Air Force because I grew up in a small town called Winslow, Indiana I went to Bloomington, Indiana for college and didn't really know much about the world outside of those walls. But um, I think at, when, at the time when I joined in uh, 2005, I was kind of done with the small towns and I wanted to, to move on. And that was part of my reasoning for joining. Uh, My name is Ryan Goss. I am a junior at the college and I run the uh, comedy wing of the Center for Veterans Engagement. Uh, our main project has been working to create this eight week stand up comedy class for veterans in the area and uh, we're excited to see it launch off the ground. For me, comedy is a way to kind of find common ground with anyone. You know, if you can walk in a room and be complete strangers and be able to laugh together, that is an incredibly powerful thing. And a lot of the times, when you could be you could be either crying or laughing and I always choose laughter over over you know crying in particularly hard times and um, it's just kind of a universal force of unification and um, of fun and of uplifting and you know whenever you're laughing you don't feel bad in that moment um, and that's particularly powerful to me. All right, well, my name is Richard Smythe. I am a first year graduate student here at the business school. Um, I served active duty in the United States Air Force just under six years. Um, and when I separated from the Air Force, I wanted to come to a university and program that I knew was going to give back. And one of the things that the School of Business does is they emphasize a sense of community and giving back. And within the first week, we actually had a volunteer outing. And it was at that time that I met uh, Dr. Drew Stelgis and told him my intentions to um, give back to the local community, not necessarily just William & Mary itself. 
because I, I didn't necessarily like what I did while I was in the Air Force. Uh, I was a I was a mortuary officer. So um, the guy who in the movies who has to go up and tell the family, we apologize um, on behalf of the, a grateful nation. Uh, we regret to inform you that your son, your daughter, has lost his or her life in defense of the country. I was that guy. Um, and I know that there are a lot of hard jobs in the military. That that one is one. Even now, when I tell you, I get I get goosebumps because I've seen I've seen grown men fall apart. Um, I said I lost one of my really good friends. So I've I personally I had a hard time and and picking up the guitar and simply just playing. It helped me to come to peace with a lot of that pain. Uh, I would I would feel better after I played, uh, and it wasn't necessarily you. You didn't necessarily have to see what was going on in my mind. You could see a change in my demeanor after I sat down and I had the opportunity to play by myself. Um, I would come back and my emotions were higher. My voice wasn't as somber. Um, you know, not necessarily a, a, as sulking, uh, if you will. Um, and when I, when I work with Frank, um, you know, he, he's very cautious when he walks in, but after about an hour when we play together, he's more cheerful, he's more outgoing. So there's, a, there's an emotional change that you see, you actually can see in someone. Um, and I know it worked for me, and that was part of the reason why I was 100% on board with taking on the challenge of teaching others. He was thrilled that I can play the guitar uh, because, you know, there's the bond there. Veteran to veteran, sit down. You know, I've seen a lot of uh, unfortunate things, and I can relate to um, quite a few people who've seen some pretty rough stuff. And uh, it is, it's, it is, it's a moment and opportunity for um, two individuals who have shared experiences to really let go and just enjoy the bond that, in my opinion, really is only brought about through a creative release like music. It's truly amazing to me because we've, as students with a concept in mind, have formed a community that is now organic and self-sustaining. So it's become a kind of a support network. It's become a basis of camaraderie. People come from so many different backgrounds within the military, within their personal lives, but they have that shared understanding that they made that shared sacrifice. And because of that, the connections we're seeing form, people who didn't know each other before the group are, you know, friends on Facebook. They're, you know, they're writing on each other's Facebook walls now. They're going out together. It's a community around a shared interest and also a mutual understanding. And it's um, something that is, you know, pretty truly unique. So we have, uh, an, uh, we have one member of our group who's a World War II vet, uh, Joe Bruni fought in the Battle of Iwo Jima. And over the last six months, since we met him at the November Veterans Writing Project, that's not six months ago, over the last four months since we met him at the uh, Veterans Writing Project in the fall, he's been talking about at 92, he's solely living to make it to the Iwo Jima anniversary. And that anniversary was uh, this past Monday. Um, it was Monday, it was, that anniversary was February 19th. Um, and there was, a, there was a ceremony at Quantico in which he was going to be honored. Unfortunately, Joe came down with a really bad case of the flu and couldn't go to that ceremony anymore. Um, his doctor wouldn't let him leave the house. And he was devastated. Just called me on the phone, basically, not crying, but very sad that he couldn't make our writing group in February and that he wasn't going to be able to make this event. So I relayed the message I sent it to everyone on the mailing list I said look this is what's going on with Joe this is why he wasn't at the meeting he had the flu and you know it'd be great if you guys could you know just give him some phone calls send him some words of support and he called me the next week he's like Sam like I can't tell you how much better I was feeling he's like I got like 15 emails sending their support I got a phone call from someone who I never met before he never came to a writing group that I was at, but he thanked me for my service and he, he was saying he was pulling for me. And 
that's kind of the nature of the group. It's it's the people now who understand that sacrifice and are, you know, happy to thank someone even if they don't know them because they, they understand what that person's been through. And now, even further, uh, next Saturday on, on March 7th, um, we are, we've bought him some memorabilia from from uh, the Marine website. We're getting a, a custom hat, Marine hat for him with Iwo Jima with his name on it. We're getting a Iwo Jima Memorial t-shirt. We're getting him an insignia coin. And um, we reached out to one of the, uh, to the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Joint Chiefs of Staff are gonna come down and make a presentation for him because he wasn't able to. And this was all group led. This was because one of the members of our group decided that we should have our own mini uh, ceremony and presentation for Joe. And so that's kind of the nature of these programs. That's kind of how they take on a life of their own um, and you know, form really natural communities uh, around these common interests. Is it alright if I come round? Is it too late if I come out? Would you stay up to figure this out some way? If I stay here, would you come back? If I stay cool, would you be mad? Would you want me if I want you that way? Cause all I can think about is coming over, coming over All I can think about is coming over, coming over all I can think about is coming over, coming over, coming over. 